Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Word of the Day podcast, where useful words are pleasantly explained. My name is Jamie Silva, I am your host, and I am immensely pleased to be joined in the RAV4 studios today by one of our favorite talented voice actors, Ashley. Uh, Ashley, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Folks, the word Ashley and I will be exploring today is the adjective effusive. In my view, this means demonstrative and enthusiastic, especially as regards showing appreciation or affection for people. We should probably define demonstrative as well. Google puts it like this. Quote, of a person tending to openly show feelings, especially of affection, unquote. Right. That's what I was aiming for. And while you're at it, Ashley, could you actually read the Google definition for effusive as well? Sure. It goes like this, quote, expressing feelings of gratitude, pleasure or approval in an unrestrained or heartfelt manner, unquote. Uh, Thank you, Ashley. Uh, Folks, I really like the picture these definitions are painting, but I think the best way to understand what effusive is all about is not to define and describe the word, but to listen to some examples of people actually being effusive. So, since one of the main contexts in which you see people being effusive is when they're greeting others, we're going to do a little compare and contrast between an effusive greeting, which Ashley, you'll handle, and an unaffusive version, which I'll do. Ready? Ready. Okay, great. Let's say Ashley and I run into each other at a local coffee shop. In this situation, I might say, Oh, hi Ashley, how's it going? Now, this is polite, right? It's perfectly friendly, but you definitely don't get the sense that I'm just overjoyed to see her. Okay, so Ashley, what might an effusive greeting sound like here? It would sound like this. Oh my gosh, Jamie, hello! It's so good to see you. How are you? I can't believe we just ran into each other like this. Isn't it so funny? Ah, this is so exciting! And cut! Nice job, Ashley. Oh my gosh, thank you! That's so nice of you to say. It was my pleasure. Whoa, 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 Ashley, uh, you can you can pause the effusiveness for now. That was just the example. Oh, sorry. Just got a little carried away, I guess. No, oh no, I get it. It's cool. Effusiveness can have a certain momentum to it. It's hard to stop once you get going. Anyway, so folks, let's break down what you just heard. Ashley's greeting was very warm, right? Uh, very affectionate. And also, honestly, a little loud. I mean, probably the other patrons in the coffee shop would be glancing in our direction at this point. And uh, what do you think, Ashley? You think there might have been uh, a hug in there somewhere? Oh, definitely. I thought so. Effusive people just love hugs. So, just to sum up, in this hypothetical scenario, because she's being so effusive, Ashley gives the impression of being very happy to see me. True enough. But it's important to note that in theory, Jamie could have been equally excited to see me, but just didn't show it for some reason. And this is a really key aspect of effusiveness, that it's less about what you feel and much more about what you show. Yeah, that's a really crucial point. It would be so simple and so intuitive, right, if everyone out there expressed themselves all the time in a manner that precisely matched their feelings. But of course, we know this isn't so. Or at least it's a lot more complicated than that. For tons of reasons, how people behave and comport themselves and interact with others frequently depends on factors that are unrelated to their true opinions of, or feelings towards, the other person. We hinted at one of these reasons just now, like perhaps Jamie's less excited hello. And Jamie, what did that sound like again? Hi, Ashley. It's nice to see you. Thank you. So what if he just sounds like that because that's how he greets everyone? best friend or acquaintance, friend or foe, it doesn't matter. If Jamie isn't naturally a very demonstrative person, that blah tone of voice is just what you'd expect as a rule. I don't know if I'd call it blah exactly. What about reserved yet cordial? It's a little blah. Like one might say, you have resting unenthusiastic voice. Ugh, agree to disagree. But anyway, folks, you could take this logic even further. Like, what if, with most people, I communicate solely via a series of nods and grunts, punctuated by the occasional dismissive hand gesture or eye roll? But then, when I encounter Ashley at the coffee shop, I'm absolutely thrilled to see her. Like, I'm over the moon about it. This is the best thing to happen to me all week. And because of this, I manage to say something mildly polite. Which, again, would be a big deal for me. But now, let's talk about your coffee shop greeting, Ashley. What could have been going on with that? Yes, let's. So it could very well be that despite what the coffee shop patrons might think, I actually wasn't that excited to see Jamie. I was just about average excited. But if I was naturally very effusive as a person, then I would sound like that at merely average levels of excitement. And what does that sound like again, that average level of excitement? Ah, great to see you, Jamie. It's been so long. How are you these days? You want to grab coffee sometime? Oh, look, we're at a coffee shop already. How funny. Right, right, right. I remember, again. 
Uh, so, right, folks, uh, it's possible that ordinarily, Ashley is even more effusive than that. And if she were really happy to run into me, she'd be like dashing around the coffee shop, giving high fives to everyone there, including the baristas. Just from the sheer delight of randomly meeting a friend, and just from the sheer delight of being alive in general. But since she's actually feeling a little down today, or is annoyed at me or something, she dials it back to merely what you just heard. What we're driving at with all this here is that everyone has their own comfort level with this sort of thing, their own default setting, if you will, this baseline of shyness or expressiveness. And this default level will heavily influence how they interact with people, as well as how they come across, like as an introvert or an extrovert, open or reserved, that sort of thing. Exactly. Which is why you really can't leap to conclusions about someone's opinion of you or someone else just based on one or two interactions with them. Right. You got to get a bigger sample size. Or to put it another way, you got to get to know them better. You have to observe them in more situations, different social contexts with different people. If you want to get a sense of their average, their baseline, and how they deviate from that baseline in their interactions with you. It's just, it's all relative, you know? I sure do. It's like I always say, if you want to really know people, sometimes there's just no substitute for getting to know them. Is is that really what you always say? Mm-hmm. You haven't heard me say it before? I... I guess not. No, I haven't. Guess you haven't gotten to know me that well then. Oh, gosh. Uh, Let's bring it back to the main thread, shall we? We were just talking about how people's behavior varies, not just based on their personalities, but based on the situations they're in. Like, even people with naturally effusive personalities might decide to tone it down in some settings. Like, what if normally I was super outgoing and expressive, but I had just finished watching a real tearjerker of a movie, one where the hero unexpectedly dies at the end, and so I'm feeling rather pensive and sad at the moment. Conversely, a couple things that could explain someone having a temporarily more jovial demeanor might be having just frolicked with a whole litter of labradoodle puppies, or maybe realizing all of a sudden that Monday is a holiday, so they get a three-day weekend. Right. You can imagine so many scenarios where your default level of effusiveness, whether low or high, just wouldn't come out. It wouldn't be smart to let it. Like, what if you were doing a job interview at a funeral home for the position of assistant director of grief management? In this situation, you probably wouldn't want to come across all jolly and exuberant. Yeah, no way. Too much cheer and your resume goes right to the bottom of the stack, no matter how many types of caskets you can describe or how skilled you are at gently insinuating that the deceased will probably haunt you if you don't buy the solid mahogany one. By the way, that position of assistant director of grief management Sounds kind of facetious, obviously, and we did make it up, but in very olden times, in tons of cultures, there were these professional mourners who would be hired by the family of the deceased. And it was their job to be in funeral processions and basically fall to pieces, wailing and crying and ripping their clothes, which were probably sackcloth, uh, and also putting dirt on themselves, tearing out or at the very least messing up their hair, and generally just carrying on to no end. And it was very much a status thing, too. You know, the more mourners you had and the sadder they acted, the more of a big deal you were. I guess people would hear all the crying and commotion and be like, oh, man, it's a real shame so-and-so passed away. It looks like they were super popular. And then they'd probably think to themselves, when I die, I want people to think I was this popular. Maybe I should call up Sad Sally's House of Lamentations and see how much it would cost to hire, oh, say, a dozen or so of these mourners. Although, I guess the price would kind of depend on your specific order. Mm, What do you mean? Well, if you want to get sort of the basic economy, you will be missed package. That would be cheaper than, say, the Our Community Has Suffered a Great Loss package. Or the Super Deluxe Maximum Despair and Hysteria How Shall We Possibly Go On package. And sorry, I know this tangent is going on kind of long, but... And also, it's kind of dark? No, I know, but it's also interesting, right? Like, as a thought experiment? Anyway, like, what I'm saying is that if you were an aspiring mourner, let's say, like, a a mourner apprentice, and you wanted to get a job at one of these big, fancy, pro-mourner outfits, you'd have to do a job interview, right? And so, one wonders, what were these interviews like? Here's what I imagine. Um, Ashley, uh, how about this? I'll be the hiring manager, and you be the job applicant, okay? Okay. (laughs) Okay, action. Ahem. Uh, Hey, uh, thanks for coming in today, Ashley. Take a seat. Thank you for taking the time, sir. I know I'd be a great fit here. I hope so. Now, I heard some of your practice wailing while you were out in the hall waiting to come in, so I don't think you have to do that again in here. Normally, I would ask for a couple reps during the interview, but in this case, not necessary. Oh, you heard those? 
Sorry about that. Um, yes, I did. The hall is like right outside this door. And again, you were really shrieking up a storm out there. That's that's good, right? No, yeah, it is. It, it definitely is. Uh, you sounded, I would say, very distraught, even a little eerie, actually, which might have had a lot to do with the acoustics or the fact that I keep most of the lights in this building off at night. But still, really a traumatizing stuff. Thank you. That means a lot. Oh, I really mean it. I think you have some serious talent. Now, Ashley, I do have a, a couple questions for you, if you don't mind. Sure, shoot. All right, first off, how long have you been in this business, Ashley? Just about five years. Okay, and the first couple years I see you spent at the discount grief apparel and accessory store, Tears R Us. I actually uh, know the owner. He's a great mentor, so that's an excellent place to start out. But fast forwarding a bit here, why'd you leave your last job at Sad Sally's? Well, I do value my time there very much, but I just felt like... Like I wasn't being challenged. Hmm, interesting. Not sad enough for you, is that it? Yeah, like some days I could just kind of be in the doldrums and that was good enough. Not a lot of opportunity for personal growth there, you know? I completely understand where you're coming from, yeah. Uh, well, next question. Are you okay with making your hair all disheveled during funeral processions? I mean, a lot of people aren't comfortable with this, especially those with like, you know, you know nicer hair like yours, so... Uh, is that going to be a problem for you or... No, no, it's no big deal. I can do disheveled. Absolutely. Some days I just, I just wake up and I embrace the disheveled look. Oh, wow. Well, that's good because that is definitely a requirement here. Um, and let's see here. It looks like you've also provided a testimonial from your mother saying that at age 14, you cried for eight days straight after your pet swallow flew south for the winter. Is that right? It is. That's impressive. But if you'll pardon my asking, was that just, you know, kind of an emo phase for you or do you still got it? Not just a phase, sir. Or at least, well, it's not like I'm sad all the time, but when necessary, I can just open the floodgates. Great. That's just great to hear. Our clients demand the best, you see. And by the best, of course, I mean absolute, unchecked, this is an existential catastrophe sort of grief. You know our company motto, right? Yes, I do. We despair because we care. Oh, fantastic. I just have one question left then. When can you start? Uh, are you serious? Congratulations, Ashley. We are so excited to have you. And scene. Now, just as a quick closing FYI, the job of professional mourner hasn't died out entirely, so to speak. You still see it in some places, China and South Korea especially. Though I'm not sure if they're all doing the same thing as their old-timey equivalents did, or if they've maybe toned things down a tad for the modern age. But anyway, where were we? Usage for effusive. First, although generally effusive will refer to people's interactions with each other and how affectionate they are, it's possible to be effusive about things too. Like, if you're gushing over something, that still counts. Yeah, like, for example, if three pairs of adorable kitten mittens are being sold... Sorry, Jamie. Are you talking about mittens for kittens? Yeah, that's right. If each pair of these kitten mittens is equipped with a little GPS tag so they'll never get lost, and you see this amazing new product in a store, and you're just going gaga over it, that means, once again, that you're being effusive, even though what you're reacting to isn't a person. The last little thing harkens back to what we talked about before, of everyone's effusiveness default or baseline being different. See, odds are, whatever your baseline is will influence how you read other people and interpret their behavior. Yeah, which really makes sense. Like, while I think we can often see this in ourselves, or certainly in others, it can still be the source of a lot of misunderstandings, you know? A more reserved person is more likely to interpret a naturally effusive person as being, like, super into them. Whereas that more effusive person wouldn't recognize the mild and understated attempts of their shyer counterpart as a sign of significant regard. Sounds like a real ships in the night problem. No doubt. Okay, let's now get a couple final examples of how to use effusive in ordinary conversation or writing. Although, I think we've already covered the conversation angle pretty thoroughly, so let's just close with a couple literature examples. Uh, Ashley, lead us off. Well, example number one comes from a collection of short stories entitled The Matador of the Five Towns and Other Stories by the English author Arnold Bennett. Quote, It cannot be considered unnatural that Mrs. and Miss Ebag, with the assistance of the vicar, should have managed the affairs of the church. They and the vicar, in a friendly and effusive sort of way, hated each other. 
Although hating each other in an effusive way may sound like a contradiction and is definitely written tongue in cheek, I think it beautifully describes a pretty common life situation where like you really don't get along with someone, but both of you are dignified and professional sorts of people. So you can't show your disdain for them by like yelling insults or whatever. So you're just as friendly as can be while still making it clear in subtle, probably passive aggressive ways that you can't stand the other person. Okay, I'll do example number two, which comes slightly paraphrased from the book Lady Baltimore by the American author Owen Wister and published in 1906. Quote, Beverly was his customary charming, effusive self, coming out of the automobile towards me with his customary by Jove, old man, and his who'd have thought it, old fellow, while sprinkling polite little drops of jolly humor over us collectively, just as the garden water-turning apparatus sprinkles a lawn. The garden water-turning apparatus? I know, weird, isn't it? Mind you, this book was published in 1906. Sprinklers must have been cutting-edge technology back then, which meant that people still had an antiquated and overly detailed name for them, I guess. Okay, folks, I think that'll do it for us, and that'll do it for today's episode. Ashley, such a delight to have you on today. Thanks for being here. You got it, Jamie. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we hope you found this episode as unimaginably informative and superlatively entertaining as we strove to make it. For all of us here at the show, this is your host, Jamie Silva, saying so long from the RAV4 Studios, And, you know, I feel like we just don't say this enough. Thank you so, so much for tuning in. We appreciate each and every one of you listeners more than you could ever know. I mean, you're just the most loyal, intelligent, fun, interesting, and all-around best batch of listeners a podcast could hope for. And we're just, ah, we couldn't possibly express how much we value your time and attention and value you as people, both individually and collectively. If you were ever in the neighborhood or wanted to get coffee, you know, there's nothing that would bring us more joy, I tell you what. And producer Pete feels the, the same way about you guys, I think. Thank you again, and good night.